Amen. Pat yourself on the back this morning. Just go ahead, just a couple of pats. Do it till you feel it. Like make sure you really feel it. Because nobody knows what you had to go through to be where you are right now. Y'all not saying anything. I said nobody knows. Nobody knows. Even the people you have told don't have a real understanding of what it has taken for you to come to this place where you are in your life. So I pat you on the back. Do it one more time. Just familiarize yourself with the feeling. This pat says it's going to be okay, but it says you're going to make it. Come on, it's a little encouragement. It's going to be all right. Come on, speak it out of your mouth. It's going to be all right. Tell yourself it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. We are in. It's just so much going on in the world. I'm going to I'm going to enter into this message that I began and it's talking about the when deities collide. It is a it is a spiritual warfare message. And when I got up to preach it in Alabama, I didn't recognize how much warfare it was going to instigate. And so when I got up to preach, I think some of you are probably familiar with that. I immediately was thrust into this place of a really serious attack that I don't anticipate happening here because this place is the seat of my rule. But I can still feel resistance because when we're engaging these realms, um, one of the things that came to me this morning in my prayer time, very early in the morning, is that some of us don't realize how real this actually is. And, and to those of you who don't know how real it is, it's, it's, I don't want you to be ignorant of the enemy's devices like the Bible says. But sometimes the fact that you don't know how real it is might be an insulation to you. Now, I'm not, I'm not, tell, I'm not an advocate for ignorance on any level. I think that you should know your enemy. You got to know how to engage him. You have to know how to win. You got to know your God and you have to know your victory. But there are dimensions of this war that if you are not on the front line of it, you should thank God that you are where you are in the middle of the war because it is a very real war. We're fighting this war on a multiplicity of levels. We are dealing with agendas. We are dealing with uh, things that are happening in political seats of authority and rule. We are dealing with things that are literally released out of the pit of hell itself. And some of the delusion, some of the deception, some of the ignorance has been carefully contrived by the enemy to keep you in a place of bondage. And to the extent that you are not willing to break out of that, it will be to that extent that your enemy has the upper hand. To whom much is given, much is required. You have to know your rank. Somebody say, know your rank. You have to know your rank. You have to know your assignment. Because if you don't know your rank and you don't know your assignment, you will covet somebody else's assignment. But you don't have what it takes to fulfill it. Come on. If you don't know your rank and your assignment, you will look at somebody's life that has a little bit less of, of, of a warfare and you'll start to want that, not realizing that you are negotiating with a demonic prince that is going to at some point come and extract payment from your life. I've got people that are called to be high ranking prophets that have settled for a life of being backslidden. It seems like everything is easy now, but at some point, somebody say at some point, those princes that you cut that deal with, that got you out of your seat of authority, they're coming to collect payment. Y'all didn't hear me. Y'all didn't hear me. You heard me, but you didn't hear me. <clears throat> I said they're coming to collect payment because from certain places in God, you can't fall from it. You have to negotiate your way out of it. You have to have a transaction with the kingdom of darkness that says you're willing to sell your mantleship and your authority and your power to this fallen God that's coming to take you out of your place. I taught you all years ago, if you can recall it, but I talked about how Adam and Eve dealing with the hissing of the serpent in the Garden of Eden was not just specific to their experience. I said the serpent is still hissing. And so when it comes and it gives you an alternative, somebody shout the alternative. You have to have enough Holy Ghost to know not to take the alternative. Because he never tells you what it's going to cost you. He just says what's going to appease to your immediate desire. 
Now, they could have ate any fruit in that entire garden. And I believe they were powerful enough to create some more. But he came with an idea that said, but the thing you can't touch is what you ought to touch. Y'all not going to hear. Y'all, y'all. The destiny that's not assigned to you is the one that you desire the most. The thing that you cannot have is the thing that's keeping you up all night, all morning, because it's the thing that you want. When the simplest solution is just obeying what God has already said. So we're in a war. We, we are in a war, and in this war that we are in, it is not week-specific. It is not month-specific. It's not we're here and we're saying we're in a war, and then two weeks later the warfare is going to be over. No, this is a very specific and strategic war that is being released against the church. And you can look at this in Psalms 2. You can look at it in the book of Revelation. There is a... There is, it is, is a cosmic war, it is a stratospheric war, but it is a war that is in every single sector and sphere of society. Y'all hear me, y'all tired already. Y'all start yawning, I get nervous. I think it's demons. Because if I was up here saying it was, it was, it is so, y'all would still be dancing. But when I tell you that there's an enemy that's trying to suck the life out of you, then the nap spirit comes. And, and, and if we think about it, there are many times in scripture where God tells the church to awaken out of its slumber. Because part of the warfare is to put us to sleep. So I'm going to, I'm going to enter into this message and I'll hit some of the high points of it because I don't want to stir too much up. But we're going to deal with where we are. First Kings 18 verses 20 through 24. I'll just stop there. There's two other sections, 30 through 32 and 36 through 39. I might get to them at the end. First Kings 18 verses 20 through 24. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. It's important that you understand that these prophets, um, well, the Bible doesn't call them false prophets. But some of these prophets that he gathered were prophets of Baal. It's interesting he doesn't call them false prophets. But they were serving Baal and serving the wrong kingdom. Which says something to me. Uh, just, But I can't go in all of that. Um, verse 21. Uh, leave it alone. And Elijah came to all the people and said, how long? Listen to this question. Listen to this question. Because all of your warfare in this season and in every season is always going to be over an idea. It's always going to be over an opinion. It's always going to be over a sense of reality and your ability to choose what God wants you to believe. Y'all all right? Everybody all right? Shake yourself a little bit. Y'all look like y'all just going through too much. Maybe I'm too sensitive. I got stopped in 3 a.m. prayers or something. I don't know what it is. Huh? It's always going to be over a thought. That's why the Bible says that we have to cast down every thought. Somebody say every thought. We have to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Now, that thought is the thought that you think in your head, but it is also the prevailing ideology. Somebody say amen. amen. The prevailing ideology that can be over a culture or over a people, over a territory. Somebody say every thought, every thought. has to be brought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. All right. How long will you falter between two opinions? So they're double-minded. They're going back and forth. They're not concrete or resolute in their worship or service. If the Lord is God, follow him. Tell your neighbor, say, if the Lord, if, the Lord, if he, is God, he is God, then follow him. He's not leading you to the club. <laughs> Unless you're going to evangelize. And if he does that, you're going to be outside, not at the bar with a drink. People walk in, man of God, woman of God, what you doing in here? Oh, I'm just out here witnessing. I'm being a light in darkness. Your speech slurring. Them ain't tongues. That's slurred speech. If he is God, come on. Oh, God, help me get this out the way I hear it. If he's God, if he is, then follow him. If he's God, it means we have to be in obedience to everything that pertains to godliness. Jesus, help me. 
There's some things that we ought not have to say amongst believers. That is now the norm of what has to be preached. God, if we grew up under this kind of preaching, the difference we would be making in the world. There's some things that should not be named amongst believers. But we have preached a message of unsanctified mercy and diluted grace to the point where now we think it is okay to be in worse condition than the people that are in the world. There was a day when the people of God were sanctified and glad to be sanctified. Now, when I say sanctified, I don't mean religious. I mean they lived their lives in a space of separation, and they were glad that they belonged to God and not... They weren't in the world. They didn't belong to the devil. Come on. The saints didn't have to have deliverance service every week for the same saints. Because they live their lives as unto the Lord. If he is God, follow him. But if it's Baal, then follow him. That means you got a decision to make. You got a decision to make. Because the one you follow, watch this, is the one that's coming to collect your soul when you cross over into eternity. I don't care how churchy you are down here in front of us. I'm preaching apostolically. Huh? The deity that you follow is the one you worship. Who is quiet? You know, I'm really made for war. I'm really designed for it. Because it really pushes my buttons and turns my gears on. When, when, I, feel, when I feel resistance, there's something in me that just clicks. If you name the name of Christ, the Bible says depart from iniquity. We done all been there. But we got to depart. <laughs> huh? Come on, y'all. You can't use someone else's sin as an excuse for you staying in it. Not when the Bible says to work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling. I'd be like, look at all the believers in sin. Y'all all going to hell because I ain't going. They've convinced us that hell doesn't exist. That's why people, all right, I'll keep going. If he's Baal, if Baal is God, tell your neighbor, say, if Baal is God, then follow Baal. Now, what does Baal want you to do? Number one, he wants you to be at an altar, calling forth his power, cutting your wrists, releasing a blood sacrifice, because that's what they were doing. They cried out morning to night. Baal, hear us. Read it. It's right there in the text. First Corinthians, I mean, First Kings 18. They cried out to him. They got to the point when it came to the evening sacrifice, he had not responded. They begin to lance themselves. Baal's always going to have you at an altar shedding blood. If it's not your blood, it's the blood of an animal. If it's not the blood of an animal, it's the blood of a human. But the people answered him not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces, lay it on the wood, put no fire under it, and I will prepare the other bull. I'm going to lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods. See, because the premise is he went into this contest saying, let the God who answers by fire. Let the God who responds by fire, let him be God, let him be established as God. So he said, let's give what gods want. He said, what do, what do gods want? They want worship. He said, let's build an altar. What do gods want? They want sacrifice. He said, you get a bull, I get a bull. What do gods want? Gods want intercession. Come on, let's call on the name of our God. I'm calling on Yahweh, and you call on Baal. Let's see which one of us is going to get the response first. And whichever one of our deities can cause the fire to materialize on the altar. I feel fire now. 
We're going to enthrone that deity over the nation because he's worthy to be praised. Hmm. Let's make it, let's make it uh, contemporary. The God that can heal your cancer. Let's worship him. Because if he's in the club, then we all need to be in the club. Y'all don't like it. If he's in the bed of fornication or adultery, then let's jump in the bed and let's get that God to show up. If he's the healer, because we're dealing with a generation in the church where we have been contaminated at 3 a.m. I'm praying, God, remove the contamination out of the body. We have compromised. Y'all don't like this kind of preaching. We have committed adultery. What does it mean to adultery? It means to dilute. We have compromised. We brought Baal into your house and worshiped him. Because we put sexuality on display. We come out of beds of fornication and sin and lasciviousness and get up here and worship as if God is not holy and commanding us to be holy. We created altars of idolatry in the face of God and dared him to have an offense. Because it's not in your nature. You're a loving God. Ain't that what we tell him? Your mercy comes to a thousand generations. Isn't that what we say? He said, call on the name of your gods and I'll call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. This season of transition that we're in, you got to pay attention to it. I talked about it. I've been saying this for weeks. I say it every time I preach. So if you're listening to me and you've heard me preach, I'm going to say it again. Can I say, say it again? Yeah. It's the anointing of the sons of Issachar. Out of the 12 tribes of Israel, Issachar's responsibility was to discern the time and the season of God. They knew where God was. They knew what he was doing, how he was moving. But they had understanding not just of the time and season, but they knew what had to be applied in every time and in every season. Right? So in other words, they knew what God was looking for. They knew what the response had to be. Can I tell you that we are operating with spiritual blindness and most of us don't know it? Oh, come on. I got three people saying yes. Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. I said we're operating with spiritual. How do I know? Because we're walking around unaware of the time and the season. Well, how can you tell me what I know? Because if you were aware your response would be different than what we observe. This isn't the season for ulterior motives and agendas. Y'all not going to help. This is not the season for us to have to relearn again the elementary principles of Christ. This is not the season for us to have an inferiority complex about who we are and what we've been called to do. I can tell that you don't know where we are by what you do. We're in the space where we have got to deserve. We have to have prophetic awareness of what's going on in the world. Alice Bailey, the New Age witch that I taught you about, in 1949 comes up with a 10-point plan to turn America to a non-Christian and pagan nation. She channeled a demonic prince. DK is what he went by for short. He said it's going to take 50 years to get your plan incepted into the nation. But if you can do it, you can get the nation to enthrone Baal instead of Yahweh. Y'all don't like it, but I'm telling you the truth. So now we are dealing with the consequences of a witch who called the prophets to a contest on top of Mount Carmel, but the prophets of God didn't wait till the fire fell. One witch. 
shifted a nation. So then what are we doing with all this power? Y'all not... Uh, What are we doing with all our tongues? What are we doing with all our worship? What are we doing with all of our atmosphere? What is it benefiting the earth? Outside of our own sense of accomplishment. Want to know why? It's not benefiting nobody? Because we're worshiping ourselves and we just don't know. We're worshiping our idea of worship. Y'all, back up off of me. Back up off of me. Because a real worship experience, come on, y'all not going to like it. But if it doesn't change you first, you have not encountered real worship. Been there, done it with the best of them. I could dance with the best of them. I fell out with the best of them. And I'm telling you, it was all false. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Let's start with the prerequisites. Y'all not ready, but he has to have clean hands. He has to have a pure heart. He cannot have sworn deceitfully. He cannot have lifted up his soul to vanity. It's only then that you can ascend the hill, which is not even a guarantee that you'll get to the top, but you can't start moving without the prerequisite. We've created a culture in the church that is happy being at the base of the mountain and not ascending the hill. We're not hungry for the presence. Oh, come on, y'all. Not realizing that Baal has prophets that are louder than the prophets of Yahweh. Bales, oh God, Jesus, help me, God, help me. They're more popular because they say what the people want to hear. They're more popular because they're working witchcraft and you don't even know you're under a witchcraft spell when they're emptying out your bank account to tell you your address. Wake up out of your slumber. It's the spirit of Baal in the church. Just because it's prophetic doesn't mean it's of God. He called prophets to the altar. Huh? He didn't say false prophet. He called prophets. Huh? Which meant at some point, y'all not going to like it. Oh, God, help me. At some point, they had to be prophets of God. Because they didn't lose their original label. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Somebody still listening to a prophet that got their original ordination certificate, but you don't know. They don't switch gods on you. They're worshiping Baal. They're doing stuff in this. He said, the God who answers by fire. So this season of warfare that we're in, take your seats. I'm, I'm, I'm just done. Uh, come back to it. Season of warfare that we're in, it's cultural. It's a cultural war. It's a societal war. It's, it's a political war. It's a war about between kingdoms. It's a war between deities. So we're dealing with the clashing of deities. Let me just give you a little bit of the background of this text. You may be familiar with it. Jezebel is the daughter of Ethbaal. Ethbaal, her father, is one of the high priests in the court or in the temple of Baal. So you got to think about Jezebel. Come on, let's just let's talk about Jezzy for just a, a minute. You have to understand that before she married a Christian king, because Yahweh was already God over over the nation of Israel. So King Ahab already knew who they worship, who they served. He already knew. 
this witch was raised in a house of another deity. Now think about this. While your kids wake up and eat cereal in the morning and listen to you praying, parents, I'm trying to help you out, and listen to you quoting scriptures, and they're watching you on TV, watching all of your Christian programming, and they're being inundated and indoctrinated with Christian ideology, Jezebel is waking up in the morning in the house of Ethbaal, learning how to do blood sacrifices to get fallen deities to respond. So while your kids are eating cereal, she's learning occultism and witchcraft. Now here she goes, 5, 6, 7, 10, 15, 20. She's raised up into adulthood, steeped in occultism, witchcraft, blood sacrifice, false altars, all of the stuff that it's going to take to make her a very powerful witch over a nation, just like Alice Paley. Now she gets the idea that it's time for us to evict Yahweh out of the nation of Israel. Let's enthrone Baal over the nation. How am I going to get my God, watch this, to rule over the nation? Well, I got to get the man that's in the seat. Y'all going to catch up. So now she's a seductress because she has to get Ahab to decide to marry her. Y'all better watch these Jezebelic agendas y'all keep falling into. I done fell into a couple myself, so I already know what it looked like. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Y'all can be quiet all you want because I'll start calling out your Jezebel stuff. Huh? I said, you better watch the agenda because what you think is a haphazard chance meeting, you got to recognize that that person under that spirit with that agenda has been reared in that for years. They knew to identify you. They knew to pick you out of the crowd. They knew you were the one that had the assignment and the anointing of God. Who am I preaching to? You better watch the Jezebel that's been on assignment even before they met you. They were looking. Looking for you. The assignment was Jezebel. You've got to get in the king's palace. Whatever you got to do. Because the only way we can get the deity to switch over the nation, I've got to get to be, I got to get the people in authority to change gods. How does she do it? She seduced King Ahab, not just marrying her, but to stay married. That means they didn't go through the conventional marriage hell that we all go through. Y'all ain't going to tell the truth. This chick was hanging from the chandelier. Some of the men of God follow me. You understand me? God, I can't get no more graphic than this. Y'all know where I'm trying to go. The chandelier, upside down, inside out, boy, you turn me. Okay, this chick. was giving him something he could feel. That wasn't just making him marry, but what? Making him stay married. Because watch this, part of her name is one who will not cohabitate. So she's married, but she's not married. She's married, but she never becomes one. How did he stay? Baby, she was flipping upside down. Listen, listen, listen. Could it be the person that you can't get away from with your fornicating self has a Jezebelic assignment to bind you through your sexuality into a place that's making you divorce the true and living God? The devil is a lie. He's going to have to back up out of here. He's going to have to get up out of your life. He's going to have to let your soul go. You better open your mouth and declare that I am the property of the Most High God. For God I'll live and for God I'll die.
Some of y'all married people still fantasizing about who you done been with. The devil is a lie. You in the bed with your spouse thinking about a rendezvous. It's Jezebelic! That spirit, y'all better open your, just open your mouth. Just ask God to clean you right there. Some of your mouths ain't open, it's you. Ask him to purify you. Ask him to sanctify you. Ask him to answer by fire. You don't got to wait till the end of the message. You know how it's going to end. Come on, ask him to purify you with holy fire. Ask him to break every yoke. Ask him to break every chain. Ask him to deliver you in the seat of your emotions, in the seat of your affections, in the seat of your desire. Ask him to purify. Come on, open your mouth. Ask him, wash you in the blood. Get the contest out of your soul. This warfare that we're dealing with cannot be underestimated. Because you're dealing with an enemy that has a knowledge base. See, he has studied. They're called familiar spirits. They study your lineage. They know your ancestors before they got over here on the boat. They knew your ancestors when they were up in trees looking for nuts and squirrels and, and fruit. They've studied your pathologies. They know your weakness. Come on, they know. Y'all not going to tell the truth. They know what makes you tick. So when you see temptation personified and you got the Holy Ghost, you better speak in other tongues. You better stir yourself up in the Holy Ghost. You better start raising up in your faith so that you can deal with the principality that's trying to take you out of your position. Y'all not saying open your mouth. I can't hear nothing. I can't hear deliverance. I need to hear deliverance out of your belly. I need to hear a sound that the chains are breaking. Come on. Break. Break. You are ensnared, but you need a deliverance. You are ensnared. You are ensnared, but you need to God, hey, shut up. You better trust him right in this moment. Lay an axe to the root of the tree. Lay an axe to the root of the system. Come on, ask him to purify. Ask him to deliver. Ask him to break the yoke, to break the chain, to break the pattern, to break the cycle. Come on, open your mouth. Come on, open. Come on. There's deliverance. There's deliverance. We are delivered. By the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony you have to say something you've got to open your mouth you've got to decree it you've got to declare it you've got to renounce it come on we renounce it every generational curse every generational spirit every familiar spirit every ungodly soul tie that has been passed from generation to generation every cycle of defeat every cycle of adultery every cycle of divorce father every cycle of idolatry and alcoholism and addiction we are announcing we break it every cycle of depression and fear we break it every cycle of poverty and death prematurely we break it we renounce it come on open your mouth come on this is how you get free come on renounce it until it breaks renounce it until it breaks renounce it no premature death no murder is gonna snatch you out come on pray this is deliverance father we deal with legality 
We file papers in the courts of heaven that the oppression of the enemy is broken. We file papers in the courts of heaven to break, obey, shete, ratoko shaba. Every assignment of the principalities of Baal and Jezebel. Father, let the blood of Jesus sanctify and wash us and cleanse us. Come on, open your mouth. It's not okay for your children to be overtaken with sexual vices and sins. It's not okay for believers to choose an alternative lifestyle. It's not okay that we've been raped and molested before we could decide and had things happen to us in our soul and we've been dealing with broken pieces all of our lives. It's still Jezebelic. It's not okay. This spirit is after identity. This spirit is after what you believe about you when you wake up and see yourself in the mirror. This spirit is after your worship. Who you gonna serve? Who you gonna follow? Who are you going to obey? Because you're obeying one or the other. You think it's about your free will and your freedom of choice. No, 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 no. It's always about worship. Because there's always a deity on the other side of your yes, whatever you're saying yes to. Listen, there's always a deity operating on the other side of your yes. We've given the enemy place. We've given him permission to enter into our lives. And instead of casting him out, we've made excuses for why he should remain. In this text, there is a collision between deities. Keep playing. And although Baal has no voice, he has an army. He's got priests, he's got prophets who are committed to fulfilling his agenda. He's got a queen to marry a king so that she could affect the entire realm of his kingdom. That means for every believer that understands who you are as a king and a priest, there's a Jezebel waiting. Because if she can get you in your place of kingdom rule, she can get your whole kingdom. She can get everything attached to you. Charisma released a magazine talking about Bishop Jakes and Pastor Tony Evans and the other pastor. I don't remember his name. And people are doing what they do because everybody has an agenda but the author of the article posed a question is this spiritual warfare is it an attack that three preachers recognized by name around the world are all in the same city dealing with the same thing come on believe see we don't <laughs> As long as we think it's just character flaws, then we won't deal with the real enemy. See, no response. That means I'm not convinced. That's what that, that's, I don't buy into what I just heard. Until it's you. When it's you, then you're going to want to call intercessors. <laughs> When it's you, you're going to want to talk to the pastor for counsel. When it's your house. But what about the men?
millions of people in the body who are impacted by their failure. And you think Satan didn't have nothing to do with it? Nothing? Not, not even a little bit? When deities collide. Yahweh wants. What we have to be convinced of is that we are committed to and connected to the winning side. And that no matter where we've been, there's deliverance. See, y'all make some noise for that, huh? No matter what we have encountered, there's a way of escape. Come on, there is a way of escape. We can get our purity back. We can get our sanctification back. We can get our holiness back. We can get our righteousness back. Everybody stand in. I'll just pick that up for the rest of the other day. Can you lift your hands up as an act of surrender to the Most High God? Yahweh, we surrender. Just talk out of your mouth. We surrender. We know that Baal is not God. We know Buddha and Confucius and Allah and all of those deities, they are not you. And so we won't follow them. Come on, open your mouth. We will not follow gods of religion and occultism and witchcraft. But we will follow the true and living God. Come on, open your mouth. You have to declare it. You have to say this. It's with the heart that you believe unto righteousness, but it is with the mouth that you confess unto salvation. Open your mouth and declare. We will not follow another God. We will not worship or serve another deity. You are Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You are the true and living God. We honor and worship you. We submit our lives to you, body, soul, and spirit, spirit, soul, and body. Every part of us belongs to you. We ask you to fill us. We ask you to enter in and make your abode in our beings. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Fill us to overflowing with you. Close every open doorway that we have ever opened to the kingdom of darkness. Any place of communion or agreement with the kingdom of darkness, we renounce it. Y'all not saying anything. I'm getting nervous. Y'all just want to keep your demons. If you want to keep them, sit down. So I know not to direct any of my faith in your direction. Come on, renounce it. Command it to break off of your mind, out of your life of your body. Father, make us holy as you are holy. Let your holiness consume us. Let your fire consume us. We acknowledge that we've talked to some Jezebels. Some of us have been Jezebel. But we repent. Come on. We repent. We repent. If we're breathing, we can repent. So, Father, we repent. We repent. We ask you, Father, to have mercy. Deliver our lineage from our poor decisions, from doorways that we may have opened. Set our children free and our grandchildren and their grandchildren and their grandchildren you will call. Let them find deliverance. 